Hello everybody, welcome back to another video from HSTV and in today's video, as you can see by the video title, I'm going to be doing a bit of a life update and a and a with you guys. So I did ask you to post in some questions or the Instagram and YouTube community post. So I'll be answering some of your questions today. I have to say it's been so long since I actually recorded in my bedroom. The past five weeks were really hectic because I was in Dumfries doing my paediatrics placement. And now that I've gotten back, I've gotten straight into my hot boo block. So hot boo, <laughs> you might be wondering what is she on about, is hematology, oncology, palliative care, um, breast and urology. So all of them are very closely linked and that's why it is a five week block. Now the interesting thing is I did actually want to do this whole video in Urdu um, but I did a bit of a vote and majority of you guys wanted English. So um, there are some questions in here that have been asked in Urdu or Hindi. Okay so questions are going to come in different uh, orders and different categories. So I'm just gonna do it in a random order. Um, first question is, are you preparing for future specialty CV already or mostly try and focus and enjoy clinical years? Thank you. So thank you very much for your question. Um, what I would say to that is, I think that building up your portfolio can be enjoying in itself. Um, for someone like me, I'm very goal oriented. And if you've been following the channel, you'll know that I want to do cardiothoracic surgery, which is quite a competitive career. Um, so for that, obviously I do have to think about portfolio building early on, and it's not necessarily so I can get points on um, my surgical training application. It's more about building those connections early, trying to build up those skills early, so that as I move into graduating and becoming a doctor, I have those good foundations in place for further opportunities. Um, so I will always put myself out there for leadership positions, research projects, that kind of thing. And um, you know, if I have time for them, it is something I enjoy. So I would say I'm enjoying medical school whilst also building my portfolio. The next question is, India and Indians ke baare mein aap ke kya khayalat hain? So this is, you know, everybody knows the rivalry between, you know, Pakistanis and Indians, but I think the new generation, I mean, obviously I can't speak for everybody, but I think certainly for myself, you know, I think we're growing out of that. And I, you know, I, I don't have an issue with Indians um, in terms of what I think about them. I, I think that Indians are wonderful people. I know a lot of Indian um, like medical student friends and colleagues and, uh, you know, some of the most hardworking, most talented cardiothoracic surgeons I know are also Indian. So um, I don't think it makes a big difference what your ethnicity is. I think it's more about who you are as a person and the personality that you give off. So I, I from the Indians that I have met, I'm, I'm very impressed and uh, I think that we need to get over the India-Pakistan rivalry. <laughs> the next question is, med school mein sabse mushkil cheez kya hai? Social life ke liye kitna time milta hai? So most difficult thing in medical school, I would say is probably the workload, especially in fifth year, I'm feeling it a lot more. Like it seems that every year the workload just seems to get higher and higher. Um, so just trying to learn everything. And also the fact that learning techniques change every year, you know, like every year I'm like, this is working, this is exactly what I'm gonna use next year. And then next year comes along and it's gonna be something else. So it's all about kind of tailoring your studying techniques and learning how to study in itself is quite a big challenge. So yeah, I think that's the most difficult thing. And then in terms of social life, so I think you do get time for a social life in medical school, even in your fifth year. Um, for me, I've personally gotten myself into a lot of different projects. So sometimes I do struggle with having free time. However, um, because I'm living at home, I feel my family is able to refuel me very quickly and efficiently. So even if it's like having dinner with the family, which we have like every day, uh, or just sitting watching TV or just talking about my day, like these kind of things for me, give me that um, social fueling, if that makes sense. And in terms of like doing things outside, I'm not a massive like friends person, you know, I don't party or anything like that. So I think like social life means different thing for people. And for me, that is my family. What kind of student does Edinburgh value? How should I make myself stand out in personal statement and MMI interviews? I think the kind of student that Edinburgh values is probably the kind of student that any university for any degree values. Someone who's hardworking, motivated, passionate, knows what they want to do, have, has, you know, you've researched what you want to do. It can be early days when you're 17, 18 years old, even 16 years old, but I think with medicine, it is such a vast career. There is so many opportunities and it's 
really important actually that you explore that early on and really see what you're getting so see what you're getting yourself into um in terms of other things you know they want to know that you are actually a nice person you've got a nice personality and what that means is even if you are the if, if you know if for, even if you're not the most outgoing uh team worker it, that doesn't mean you're a bad person all it means is that you need to get some experience working in teams so you can have better team working skills and that's why they met the medical schools they want you to do volunteering they want you to uh, you know play sports and play instruments so that you have this diverse skill set being developed from a young age that you can continue into your medical career so i think that would be my main answer try and be the best well-rounded individual that you can be how do I select universities after my UCAT score is out? So yeah, um, obviously the application date is very near, so I can imagine many are quite anxious about choosing medical schools. I would say look at different university entry requirements because some universities will place a higher weighting on UCAT scores than others. Um, for example, at Edinburgh, you'd have to check this exactly, but it's something like 17% for the UCAT and they also take into account your situational judgment score so you know if you've gotten like a band three and a band four that's not necessarily a reflection of your judgment it's just on that day that's the band that you got maybe don't apply to edinburgh with a band three or a band four because it would mean that you are ranked lower um that's just my personal take on it so as an international student what happens after i graduate from mbchb so I can't really speak for the international students because uh, I, I'm not too sure exactly what um, you know your contract or what your terms are when you come and study in the UK. Uh, but I can tell you from some students that I know of, from like partner schools and um, you know for the UK graduates as well, you would really do two foundation years. So your first foundation year of training, you have like half of your GMC license, so you can do some prescribing. You are an official doctor, so you would do different rotations and different specialties in, in a hospital. Um, your second year, which is your foundation year two after graduating, this is when you are given your full GMC license, you can prescribe everything and you have like a, a, a bigger role, I guess. Um, and then after foundation year two, it's up to you really if you decide to apply to specialty training or uh, if you go down like the clinical fellow route and you might want to do locoming or teaching or whatever. So I can't say specifically what would be different as an international student, um, but that is what I have seen from some of the students in partner schools and then also the UK graduates. How do I review for the UCAT as an international student since there are parts of vocabulary only people in the UK would know? I think this is quite a challenging thing and probably for anybody who is wanting to work or study in a different country to where they grew up, it's always going to be challenging, right? So what I would really recommend is you actually speak to students who um, live in the country that you want to study or work in because they can give you the most real perspective but also um, they can answer your questions like for example um, I have had a student who didn't really know what a registrar was like in another country a registrar is like an admin person whereas a registrar in the UK is somebody who's like a senior specialty trainee um, who's almost a consultant so I can understand that there are certain differences between vocabulary and it can be challenging Obviously do practice, um, you know, things like uh, online question banks like Medify, they can give you good practice of questions and that includes situational judgment. I think that's really where your knowledge of the UK healthcare system is required. The other uh, parts you can do probably without um, the UK specific knowledge, but um, I think speaking to students and speaking to people who actually live in the country that you want to go to can really help and most of the time people are quite actually happy to answer questions. I'm quite happy as well so if there's something you're not sure about just message me. What are the most valuable lessons you have learned from patients? Um, this is a really good question and I think it's very relevant just now actually because at the moment as I said I'm working on my um, oncology and palliative care book and a lot of these patients are coming towards the end of their life actually and sometimes it can feel a bit depressing you know being around these patients and kind of listening to their stories but actually what I have learned to value from speaking to these patients is how precious life is and I think it might seem a bit cliched but um, medicine really does teach you life is short value your loved ones value um, the little things in life and don't be fussy you 
you know, the issues that you think are the end of the world, they're really not. And I think it just makes you a more resilient, more stronger person. When you see these people in those situations, it really grounds you and it really humbles you actually. So I think that's probably the most important lesson I've learned recently. Um, before this, I think like every day is a learning day. Every patient teaches me something new, whether that is something in uh, on a knowledge point of view or if that is something from a patient point of view. Like, you know, one of, one of my, uh, not one of my patients necessarily, but our patient in the hospital, um, they told me how um, just the way that a doctor speaks to them really impacts their relationship. So sometimes, we as like medical students or as clinicians, we're so like up in our head and thinking about like management and diagnosis and these things that we can tend to forget that we're actually speaking to a person here and um, we need to be really kind actually and really understand where that patient is coming from. They have a whole life behind them. They are not just a condition. So I think that is probably the two most important things that I've learned from patients. How do you approach teamwork and collaboration in a clinical setting? Again, really good question. So recently I had a acute simulation session. So this was a session where four medical students are put into a emergency situation with a mannequin. So the mannequin is like a, like a real life mannequin. Like it's very realistic. It breathes, it has a pulse, everything. And we have to sort of manage this acute situation. So the situation that my group was put in was um, someone who has sepsis. And what I realized is that communication is really, really key. So things like going in with a plan beforehand, before we even went into the room to see this patient, we went in with a plan and we said, you know, who's gonna be doing what? So two people are gonna be by the patient's bedside examining them asking the history, and then two people are gonna look at the charts, have a look at the past medical history, be ready to phone um, you know, a reg or whoever we wanna ask for help. So I think, first of all, like allocating roles is really important so people know exactly what they're doing and it's not very chaotic when you go in. Obviously, when you do get thrown into that situation, things do change a bit. So what I noticed is when we were doing the situation, I was able to carry out like an A to E assessment with my other colleague. We did it together and then I felt things weren't really moving. I felt like we were going too slow, like we need to ask someone for help. So um, rather than relying on one of my other colleagues to um, pick up the phone, I said to everyone, look, I'm gonna call the uh, medical registrar. Everyone was on board, great. So I just like went and did that, even though that wasn't necessarily my job. Um, and when I did that, after that, one of the things I found quite challenging is actually trying to relay what the medical registrar had said to me to my other teammates. And um, this is something that we discussed afterwards as well, but having like a team huddle um, can really help to pass on this information just so everybody knew this is what we're doing, we're following so-and-so protocol, and these are the next steps and the medical registrar is on their way. So I think communication and relaying information is really, really important. And just making sure that you remain really calm and collected in the situation is very important as well. We don't want anybody who's very panicky or anything like that, because that can really disrupt um, the dynamic of the team. But also remember, like if you have ever been a patient in hospital, it's actually really scary. And if you have lots of people like around you doing lots of different things, someone's like prodding you with needles, another person is like, checking your chest, it's very um, scary, right? So you need to stay calm. And so I think communication and being calm is very important in those situations. How does retaking an exam impact my application? So um, I believe you're talking about your application to medical school. So what I would say is when I was applying, um, the universities that I looked at, they had on their websites that we don't accept grades that are from our resitting. So we only accept your grades from your first sitting. I don't know if that has changed. You will have to see, um, depending on what universities you apply to, that might impact your application. Which subjects you advise to make own notes rather than annotating lecture slides? So this is regarding preclinical years in Edinburgh medical school. So um, so uh, from my preclinical years, what I would say is you should um, make notes on your main like physiology units. Um, that's what I did. And it has to be summary notes. I always advocate for summary notes because I think that nitpicky information you can find in textbooks, you can find in online resources, but actually just stepping back, seeing the bigger picture, 
and when you have like a attractive summary you will be able to clock onto things quicker and you'll be able to link them together and that uh, extra depth of information will come to you naturally once you see things um, laid out. So I think your basic physiology you should do, in my days it was called body in motion, so I think for body in motion you should try and take notes. In terms of anatomy, I guess it's up to you with anatomy. I think the anatomy worksheets do a pretty good job of actually telling you the stuff that you need to know so that can act as your notes. Also quizzes and things can help you to test your knowledge. Um, in terms of REBM, so research and evidence-based medicine or social and ethical aspects, I personally didn't really take many notes for these just because I found that information quite straightforward most of the time. So I felt, you know, I have the lecture slides there, I can read off them and that's fine. And again, if I did need to make any summary notes, I did that as well, but on the whole, I think focus your attention to your main physiology notes. What's your advice to get the most of GP placements and note taking during and after the session? So I would say um, GP in my year group was a very varied experience. Some students find that they were really able to involve themselves and take histories and do lots of examinations and other students found that they were sitting in the corner most of the time. So what I have noticed from my experience is the more you put yourself out there and the more you, that you go in with certain goals of the day and you let the doctors know or whoever you're working with, the more productive and more efficient your day is going to be. So if you want to do history taking, and I do recommend this, I think even if you're not confident, just do it. Rely on your adrenaline. Chances are you will come out a warrior and um, you will be fine. So you will always learn from these experiences. So do history taking, do examinations and uh, in terms of like taking notes so obviously you've got the reflections um, that you can write in afterwards uh, that you have to do as like your daily log um, but also if there's interesting conditions um, that, that you see you can just keep your own record of those diseases and it's not necessarily stuff that will be in your curriculum like I have to say my most memorable case from GP had to be this lady who thought that she had schistomiasis and when in fact actually she had like a mental condition where she was thinking that she had worms coming out of her mouth and her eyes and you know she had this whole story and it was only afterwards I read up about this condition and I found it really interesting so yeah you will learn from every case that walks in through the door because GP is just so varied so make the most of your placement that way also I know that in most of your um, GP placements you won't only be working with the GP you'll also be working with nurses and pharmacists or district nurses and um, all these people so there's lots to learn from them as well don't underestimate their knowledge I remember at my GP practice there was actually a mental health pharmacist and she had such a specialized role because uh, she was able to prescribe all these tertiary care um, psychiatric medications and so a lot of the patients they didn't actually need uh, to be referred to psychiatry they could just be managed in primary care um, which was great so make the most of these experiences and ask lots of questions if you know if you're studying psychiatry one day um, ask about the different kinds of medications and uh, just very you know be open to getting yourself involved I think that's my best advice for GP what are your resources you take notes from? So another great question. So there are obviously a lot of resources out there for medical students to take notes from. And what I would say is at the moment, I am using PassMed, Zero to Finals, and obviously my university lectures as well. So it's a bit of a mixture. It depends on what I'm studying each day, but note taking i've scaled it down significantly most of the notes that i take are now summary notes so for example if it's like congenital heart disease i will make a table of all the different types of congenital heart disease and then write down for each of them what's the type of murmur you would hear what is uh the main kind of presenting complaint the main management and i am one of those people that i love to see comparison i love to make those links so if i see something visually i'm more likely to remember it and actually link back to things so yeah i think tables and things like that is working quite nicely something zero to finals is better than past med and vice versa so just depends also textbooks so and um, Davidson's is is good but it does give you a lot of information it's a lot of text so it depends what kind of mood I'm in what I'm studying how much time I have I'll go to Davidson's if 
I do have time. Um, for paediatrics, I really recommend the illustrated textbook for paediatrics. This is a really great book for peds and I think it's quite hard to find resources on peds, even the online ones. So that's what I was using for that. All right, everyone, well, that is gonna be the end of this video. I hope you have enjoyed and I hope you have learned some things. And um, if you have any other video suggestions for me or any other questions that come up uh, past this video, then I always answer to every comment. So please um, just comment down below also follow the Instagram because I've been trying to be more engaging on there as well. Um, so if you have any questions there, you can DM me. Um, I do know that interview season for medicine uh, applications is coming up. So if you need any help with interviews, also message me. I do run an interview course as well. Let me know if you'd like to book a place. And yeah, I will see you in my next video. Take care wherever you are. And yeah, we'll catch up soon. Goodbye. Thank you.